Okay, so today I'm going to go over a lot of studies that we've done at our hospital and some that have been done just in the U.S., but really what we're looking at is yearling changes and how it affected performance. So this just, if you've never been to the U.S., this is a picture of our hospital. This is Rudin Riddle. A um, few things have changed since this picture, but obviously it's like your big practices here, um, very big operation, and um, they're very similar. So really the purpose of this is to discuss the public auctions. I think they're, they're very difficult. You're, as, as Mike said earlier, you're going to a sale, you have no history on a horse, you don't know how it was reared, um, you're not able to do a normal exam or a complete exam in, in that way, and you take the horse out of his environment, and then we're intent, our intention is to look at it, and we're supposed to predict for you how they're going to perform. So um, I think that's a very tough feat and so I want to share some research that can help give you, people as buyers, and, but also as sellers, some confidence in whether they, how they should value the horse in the auction place. So how and why the research started, I just, why, why I started this is the repository um, started at Keeneland in 1996. And when that happened, I, had, I was Dr. Bramlage's assistant at the time, and we didn't have anybody to go read films at the sale. And he said, but Debbie, I think you should do this. I said, well, I'm not going to do that. You know, very uncomfortable. I was only probably three years out of school at the time. And he said, no, go ahead. I think you're, you're ready. You can do it. Just call me if you have any questions. So um, that opened up a door of being able to call him. He won't take calls anymore. <laughs> but anyway, when it started, there was, there was, it was very different because you had such a large number of radiographs. And with a larger number of radiographs, also come more problems, and problems that we're not familiar with. And I say problems, but changes, more or less. And what's significant and what's not. And that's what we had to teach ourselves and learn and do some research on. So are all changes bad? Is there a degree of change that makes something more significant? And really, when it started, you found all these things, and then it was really hard to get buyer confidence. You know, you mentioned a change on a radiograph report, and everybody was hands off because they didn't want to bid on it because there was a problem. And so these studies are going to help give consumers that buying confidence. And then also, it's very important to mention that we also need to see, to be able to tell the owner, should you protect this horse? Should you let this horse go? So these were all the reasons that we started this. So the first thing that I looked at was um, Sesamoiditis, and the reason I did that is it was honestly the most confusing radiographic finding at the sales when I started. And Bruce Howard um, presented, he's from our practice, in 1992 at the AEP, stating that sesamoiditis was the most common radiographic change in a yearling. And I gave this paper at AAEP, AAEP in 1997, and actually I brought up these, my slides aren't going to be this poor as far as the radiographs, but this, was, this actually was a, a yearling of Mr. Lee's. And when I was asked to do this, I'm like, I have got to find those radiographs. And so I did. And you can see over to the far right, you see those three arrows that are pointing to the left. And those are three very enlarged canals. And then if you look on the base, you see, also see this proliferation on the bottom of the sesamoid. And this is what made me want to do this study. Because when I looked at this horse with Dr. Bramlage, we never really could tell him, is this horse ever going to be able to race? You know, what is the prognosis? And we just said, well, we'll treat it and we'll follow it. And that's what we did. Interestingly, since this, I have looked up this horse's race record after I got these films the other day. And um, he raced twice, he won once, and uh, both at five furlongs. So I was actually quite surprised at that. So it took me a while, but in 2003, I, I finally got this published in EBJ. And what we looked at was 487 thoroughbred yearlings with radiographic changes of the proximal sesamoid. And um, these were on radiographs that were both pre and post sale from 91 to 94. And one thing to mention is they're clinically normal cases. And the reason I say that is these are horses that warranted being x-rayed, so they were either they had already purchased it or they were wanting to purchase it. And it can be expensive to x-ray an entire horse, so this reason we say that these horses were clinically nor normal, otherwise they wouldn't have warranted being x-rayed. And really the significance of sesamoiditis 
And what we were looking at is this area here where the suspensory ligament or ligament branch inserts. So what I wanted to do was categorize proximal sesamoids. What's sesamoiditis? And it wasn't well defined. And if you look at the picture on the left, there's just a normal sesamoid, really no vascular canals in there. And then you look at the one on the right and you see these kind of widened and large canals. And we've always felt vascular canals were normal because that's how the sesamoid gets its blood supply. But at what point is it significant? So I made these different categories or groups um, in this study. And the first one was no significant defects, so no linear defects in the sesamoid, as we see here in this picture. The second group was one to two linear defects, or what we would call vascular canals. And you may hear people say that. Um, these ones are very linear, linear in nature. They were less than two millimeters in width. And then more than two linear defects. So as we get more defects, is that an issue with that suspensory insertion? And so this one has probably, I would have graded that as, as four linear defects in the sesamoid. And then next we came to, this is where we start to look at enlarged canals, or in, we defined them in the study as one to two abnormally shaped linear defects that were more than two millimeters in width. And you can see where the two arrows here, here you have these very enlarged canals that are widened and have this palmar border or a border along the back of the canal itself. And then my category five was more than two abnormally shaped linear defects, more than two millimeters, so in enlarged, enlarged canals. And you can see multiple enlarged canals on this sesamoid. You can also see that this one was clinical. These aren't from the study because you saw what the films looked like from the study. But you can see the soft tissue thickening, so you know that the suspensory branch is involved here. And you can also see that proliferation on the base, which is something I think we should keep in mind and just when I get to another study that we're gonna talk about. Another category I had was the lucency present at the distal abaxial border. I call this more trauma to the palmar plantar sesamoid. So this is along the back of the sesamoid. Here's normal on the left. And on the right, where the big arrow is, there's a lucency. The kind of the sesamoid itself is flattened in that area. And then there's a lucency deep to that. And we wanted to see, was this significant? And this is that same sesamoid. And here's on a lateral medial view, where you can see the one sesamoid is very rounded towards the back. And the other one has a scalloped appearance. So this is that sesamoid. And interesting, um, and most of us know this, that the majority of these the vast majority scan normally. So here's our normal suspensory branch over here. On the right, uh, the white line is the sesamoid, and you can see the suspensory inserting into the sesamoid bone. And then finally, my last category was irregular contour of the abaxial border with bone production. So this proliferative bone, but only in this area. So just on the abaxial border where that arrow is, I didn't look at the base um, like we saw in some of those other cases. So I had 487 yearlings, and 82% of them were in this categories one through three, so no canals or linear canals. And we wanted to establish, is, are, are the canals normal? So we looked at these statistically we, with starts and earnings and earnings per start, and determined that these two categories are equal, and so we considered those normal, and this is what we are gonna end up using as our controls. So really the significance in this study came with the enlarged vascular canals. So you can see this picture on the left, I would consider that two enlarged canals. In the middle, one enlarged canal, but that one does have proliferation. And over on the right, that one is probably, in, in my opinion, three enlarged canals. But if you go to the very up, uppermost canal, you'll see that it's very linear and then it just kind of comes out. But there's no caudal border and we'll, we'll talk about that some. So these are the, the stats of it. So if you look at the two-year-old average starts, um, there was a decrease in both of the enlarged canals categories compared to the normals. And there's the, the p-values over there, the significance. We look at three-year-olds. Um, again, we have a decrease of, of only the larger group. So the three or more enlarged canals, and that was statistically significant. You can see the one to two enlarged canals, which is a quite a large number of the ones that we see that have enlarged canals um, were fine. 
average earnings. So we look at three areas, starts, earnings, and earnings per start. And so in average earnings, again, we have um, the three or more enlarged canals had decreased average earnings at two and at three as well. And then the average earnings per start was also decreased, decreased not surprising. Again, this is only that larger group, or the, the more significant says my data. Sorry, it's a very small group, actually. So they had decreased earnings per start at two, and then again at three. You can see the significance there. So that category four, which is the one to two enlarged canals, which we saw the significance at two, but not at three. Um, we have, if you look at the picture on the right, I mean, obviously we wanted to see, is there a difference between front limb seismoiditis and hind limb seismoiditis? And um, this study had enough that it allowed us to do that. With 76 horses, we looked at the front limb only, which was 29%, the hind limb only, 57%, so more common in the hind limb, and four and hind limb together. And what we saw was that the forelimb only had fewer starts at two, which is what we saw with the group. The hindlimb only had fewer starts at two, also what we saw with the group. And, but they also had decreased two-year-old earnings compared to the group and the significance is there. But if we looked, had horses that had four and hindlimb seismoiditis um, <coughs> together, so it was more generalized, there was no difference in any response category. And I think, we think the reason that is, is you, you pretty much eliminate the horses that had an injury to a particular limb and had seismoiditis because of that. Um, here's a picture on the right, just you see those two enlarged canals. We also feel like the ones that have it all the way around may be those longer pasterned, um, weaker horses that as they mature, um, they strengthen. And the seismoiditis um, is not as significant when they're racing, or isn't significant. So there were, there were several ones that didn't have any significance, and those are those two last categories. So category six, which was the lucency present at the distal abaxial border, which is what I call the trauma. Um, one thing I should say is there were no ultrasounds in this study because these were clinically normal horses. The radiographs were just done to either say whether or not they wanted to bid on the horse or after they purchased it. And the other reason that we thought weren't surprised to see that there was no difference, is this is not where the suspensory attaches. Remember on that lateral view I showed you, really the trauma is around the back where the anterior ligament attaches. So it's not in that same location of the area that we're most concerned about. With the anterior ligament, you can actually cut that ligament and do, typically in some problems you do and the horses race okay. So these were not statistically significant, which wasn't a surprise, but with only 39 horses, probably need to do a bigger study. And then the other one was the irregular contour of the abaxial border, so the bone production in this area here. Um, again, there were no ultrasounds in this study, and they were clinically normal. So I have to believe that these were um, lesser proliferations than one we might often see on just a blanket radiographic exams. So. so next I wanna just briefly discuss um, radiographic changes in thoroughbred yearlings. And this was a prevalent study that Al Cain did, and he published this in EBJ in 2003. And when we talked about abnormal canals, what he defined as abnormal canals, he had 47% prevalence in that one to two abnormal canal group. And the greater than two abnormal canals, so the more significant seismoiditis, had 32% prevalence. If you look at my study, there were one to two abnormal canals was 16% and greater than two was only 2%. A couple things that are different about this, um, and Kane's study had a lot more horses, but he also had one year of repository radiographs in there. Again, once you get to the repository, you're looking at, it's a blanket group of horses. It's not just ones that were looked at specifically to be purchased or on a post-purchase basis. And so I think that's part of the difference, but the other obviously is how he graded them which just brings to light the whole subjectivity of grading seismoiditis. And that's why I did the study, is try to define it, and um, it's still hard to define well, um, unless you have specific cases that are very obvious. 
So this brings us to these enlarged canals, because that was the difference between Keynes and my study. And in mine, um, the enlarged canals had non-parallel borders, but they could be, I'm fine with a, a canal like this top one on the right, the very uppermost canal. It is linear for a while, and then it just kind of opens up and allows for the vascular to come in. I'm not as critical of those as I would be at the very lower ones on the sesamoid there. So for me, they have to have this kind of club shape. They have to have this border at the very outmost portion of the canal. Um, but a normal canal, I allowed for a conical entrance or a funnel shape entrance to that canal. So then um, Jonathan McClellan out of Florida um, published this in EVJ in 2014. And he looked at, do radiographic signs of sesamoiditis in the yearlings predispose them to suspensory ligament branch injury, which is why we feel that the sesamoids are so significant. And what he did was modified Kane's scale and mine scale and basically did a much better job of describing what an abnormal canal was than what I did. <laughs> so he, um, in, in my study, the, the larger lucent area on the kind of middle portion of that sesamoid, that's an enlarged canal. And then my study, that top one, which looks pretty linear, but then it kind of goes outwards toward the end, it's not perfectly parallel, for me, was a normal canal. For Dr. Kane, um, they were not permitted to have any variance. They had to be completely linear. And he did not allow for a conical opening. So no opening, they had to be perfectly linear for me. I was okay with them having an opening at the end of that canal. So that was the difference between ours. And so he continued to modify this more. And so then he, the, that was, those were the category twos. Category three for Kane was any number of non-parallel canals more than two millimeters in width. So that was his abnormal canals. I know this is gonna, sounds confusing. And then the modified spike pierce was one to two abnormally sh shaped linear canals more than two millimeters in width and then four was the three or more. So when he did the statistics on this, he looked at them, um, where it was statistically significant is the modified spike pierce groups, three and four. Um, it was more common to have a sp suspensory ligament branch injury, therefore he combined them. And what he came out with was a sesamoiditis greater than or equal to the grade three. So again, it's these enlarged canals. As yearlings were almost five times more likely to develop um, suspensory branch injury. So then um, Jonathan and, and Sarah Plevin um, also published this one in EVJ in 2014. And the reason I mention this is because these were ultrasounded in September of their yearling year. So again, a fi finding that you could find at the yearling sales and then um, put it into racing. Um, Mike touched on this a little bit, but couple things that they only looked at unilateral suspensory branch injury. So if they had bilateral injury or in more than one limb, they were excluded. And their categories were an enlarged branch with a, could have an irregular fiber pattern, but no tear. Um, category two was an enlarged branch with a tear that was less than 10%, which is relatively small. And then three, an enlarged branch with a tear that was more than 10% of the cross-sectional area of the branch. And just for some examples, the one on the left here, this is a um, almost 10% <coughs> branch tearing that we see with the, the darker area and the, and the yellow around it there, which so that is a category two. Up on top, this one is a little bit more than 10% of the cross-sectional area is, has a tear, and that, so that was a category three. But you could also have one here on the bottom, which is um, vastly enlarged and has a large area of tearing centrally in the branch, which was also a category three. So in his study, he compared them to a sibling, but just one sibling and whoever was closest in age that did not have sus suspensory branch ligament injury. And these were horses on a training center, so he would get horses in from the same mare, so you had um, multiple years of, of um, siblings, basically, um, that you had followed and, and knew whether or not they had the, the branch injury. So 9.5% of, of the horses in the study developed the branch injury. They were less likely to race by the end of their three-year-old year, 66% compared to the 
controls, which was 89%, and they had fewer starts in their career as well, and that's for their two and three year old year. They had decreased earnings, but equal earnings per start. So if they were able to make it through the races, um, they could hold their class, basically, but needed more time in between. The grade one lesions um, had dec decreased performance at two, but were fine at three, and that's where Mike showed it took longer for them to get to the races, but they could make it, so they were giving them time. The grade two lesions had decreased starts and earnings at two and three, and what was interesting to me was the sesamoid pathology was present in 40, only 40% 40 of the cases. So we absolutely have some of those that, you know, you may have normal rabiagrass as a yearling, and they develop suspensory branch injury as a two-year-old. And in this study, it was 60% of them that did. But the severity, severity of the suspensory branch ligament injury was significantly related to the presence of sesamoid pathology. So those were definitely the ones that had um, the worst branch injuries were the ones that had the sesamoiditis. So um, next I want to talk about, this is Al Kane's study. He's out of Colorado State, and this was in EVJ in 2003. And this is the part two of that other study um, that looked at prevalence. And so then he, after prevalence, looked at the association with racing performance of all these yearling lesions. This is the most comprehensive study that we have out there. There were 1,162 pre and post sale films. And also, as I said, there was one year of the repository. So 1996, the study went from 93 to 96. Couple things to note and remember is this study did not evaluate pasterns. Um, pasterns, um, I don't know if it, it, they just didn't present on the films, but they did not look at them. They only evaluated the medial femoral condyle of stifles from one view, which was just the lateral view, and incidentally, they didn't have any. So probably, and we know it's not the best view to project and see a medial femoral condyle lesion. And only four of the findings, and they looked at numerous findings, I should have gotten the number of that, but numerous findings, um, only four of them affected starts. And in this study as a whole, 81% of the yearlings started a race. So we'll be comparing to that. So the first thing that he found to be significant was moderate or extreme supracondylar lysis of the third metacarpus. Whenever I say this to a client when I'm giving results, they're like, what on earth is that? And it's just, it sounds terrible. And from his study, it, it could be too. But normals here on the left, um, you see a normal contour of the cannon bone coming down into the fetlock. But then on the right, you see this arrow where you have the narrowing or the indentation basically of the distal cannon bone right above the fetlock joint. And usually when I see that, I'm looking for something else going on. And you can see in this horse that there is a distal cannon bone um, lucency, I probably should point that out. So there's a distal cannon bone lucency here, a cyst, and then there's some remodeling at the joint capsule there. So there's a reason for this horse to have supracondylar lysis, which is basically um, where we see that is chronic inflammation of the fetlock joint. And um, when Kane presented this study, I asked him that. I said, Al, do you, do you, did you see other findings when you see supracondylar lysis? And he said he did not. Um, but I think when you're looking at that large of a, a number, it's, it's hard to really be able to correlate those things together while you're looking at them. But in this case, only 58% of these horses started, which was statistically significant. They looked at the statistics another way as well, so they were three times less likely to start a race as the rest of the study. But there was no difference in earnings. And what I take from that is if they have some supracondylar lysis. Again, this was moderate to severe supracondylar lysis. I'm looking for other things, and if the joint looks pristine, I'm gonna be less critical um, than what this study shows. But if there's another area of concern, obviously, um, it does make a difference in their starts. Next thing um, that he looked at, he had, uh, sesamoiditis was not significant in Kane's study. That's why I showed you the variation in the prevalence of sesamoiditis between Kane's study and my study. And, but what was significant on the sesamoids was this enthesophyte formation, which if you look at the picture on the right, at the base, the up arrow pointing to that proliferation at the base of the sesamoid, 
And then they're also at the arrow pointing to the right, there's just a tiny bit of proliferation on that abaxial border. But he looked at both of those areas. So the two of them together are in this group. So it was bony production either at the suspensory or at the base sesamoidian ligament. And this group had decreased starts, 57%. And they also were three times less likely to start a race. Um, and then he, he divided this up to front limbs and hind limbs. There was no difference in earnings in a front limb, but there was a decrease in earnings in the hind limb. When I look at those and I see the proliferation, I'm more critical if I see the enlarged canals with them. But if I don't see the enlarged canals, I'm, I may be less critical because we certainly see those in, in racehorses that seem to be racing well. So the other issue that um, Kane found, and, and three of the four findings were in the fetlock joint, was, and this was a surprise, was hind fetlock dorsal proximal P1 fragmentation. So here the picture on the left is just a normal P1, and then when you get to the right, there's your dorsal P1 fragment. In this 69, they had 69% starters, which it, that portion wasn't less than the p-value of 0.05, which is where we get our significance from. But through other statistics that they did, they showed that they were two times less likely to start, and there was no difference in earnings, which was surprising. Which brings me to this um, paper that was in EBJ in 2000, which Jorge Colon um, did this when he was with us, and he looked at the racing performance of 461 thoroughbreds, after removal of these P1 chips. And he looked at it qualitatively and quantitatively, which I'll go into a little bit. But there were 63 yearlings in this study out of 461. And 87% of them started a race, so um, pretty good level of starters. There was also a higher, higher incidence of hind limb involvement in yearlings. So 70% of yearlings, their chips were in the hind end versus the front. And um, there's the P1 chip there. So when we look at these dorsal P1 chips, there's a few things I got from this study, and I will carry that on to yearlings because there were yearlings in this study. Here's the P1 chip there, dorsal medial P1. But that they average 1.43 fragments. So typically more than one jo joint is involved. And we often see with yearlings, you might have two joints involved, you might have three joints involved. And when you get to that three joint involved, how critical are people going to be of that yearling and just say, you know, they're soft and you know, this is going to be a problem? Well, we, did, we show in this study that they do very well postoperatively. 89% of them raced and 82% of them did so at the same or a higher class. And the reason, because we can take those out and, and they do very well, so I'm less critical of yearlings that have multiple um, limb chips, knowing that the quality and quantity of their performance should not be diminished um, after removal, according to this study. This is our, just for something other than radiographs, this is our practice in Saratoga, New York. And um, so these are present um, quite commonly on yearling sales films, and we see them more in the hind limb than the front. And in that study, there was no record of removal or follow-up or, or what happened. But anecdotally, I can tell you that so many people will say, oh, it's a hind ankle. It'll be fine. It's a little chip. Not going to worry about it. And we won't do, re use, do removal. But really, this study does support removal. So when I have clients ask me, you know, is this going to be OK if we don't remove it? I say, I don't know. I mean, you can go ahead and remove it later if you choose, but this study supports the fact that they do decrease performance and um, are probably best removed. At what time you want to do that, that's up to you. So another thing we looked at was um, the apical sesamoid fracture removal, and these were horses that were under two years of age, 151 of these. Lauren Schnabel did this when she was with us, um, presented in EBJ, um, published in EBJ in 2005. I sound that she's with us, she's no longer with us. That's not the case. These are, um, typically most of our studies are done by interns. Um, they get the information going. We tell them what we would really like to look at and then kind of just help tee them up and set them up to do these studies because it's very difficult, as many of you veterinarians in the group know, if you're in clinical practice, to try to get these studies done and accomplished, which are highly needed, it's very difficult to do. So she looked back at these and these 
yearlings that had um, these apical sesamoid fracture removal. So normal on the left, there's the apical sesamoid fracture on the right. And here's the apical sesamoid fracture here. There were four horses that were euthanized um, unrelated to the apical sesamoid fracture prior to the two-year-old year. So we ended up with 147. 84% of those started, so a good number of starts. Compared to their maternal siblings, which is how we look at most of our studies, um, only 78% of the maternal siblings started. Now, I wouldn't say we're looking for apical sesamoid fractures here, but um, obviously they do very well. And there was no difference in any performance variables, so starts, earnings, earnings per start at two or three for horses that had apical sesamoid fracture removal and their maternal siblings. But we wanted to dig a little deeper. So is it really, are all of these okay? And the majority of them were hind limb, 92%. And 86% of those race post-offeratively. But when you look at the forelimb, there's only 8%, so a smaller number, but only 55% of those raced post-operatively, and um, that was significant. And then you broke it down even further, and all of the lateral apical sesamoid fractures raced from in the forelimb, but only 44% of the medial apical sesamoid fractures. So what we found was that medial forelimb apical fractures had less earnings and less earnings per start compared to other locations of sesamoid fractures. So with that, um, I'm more critical of medial sesamoid pathology, basically, at the sales than I am in front, than I am of other sesamoids. And I think it's because I think this study shows that you know, the medial sesamoids in front are, are not able to tolerate um, much loss of suspensory ligament in the front. So after that, we decided, well, let's see if the size of the fracture made a difference. So um, Lacey Cam, another intern, presented this at AEP in 2011, and she looked basically at the size and the geometry of that apical sesamoid fracture and to determine the prognosis for racing. So we had 110 weanlings and yearlings, 56 <coughs> training horses, and one thing that we were able to show is that the front sesamoid fractures tend to have a larger abaxial to axial ratio, so they're more of a straight across fracture versus that little corner that we typically see um, with apical sesamoid fractures, and that was significant. However, there was no relationship between fracture size or configuration and starts or earnings per start um, in those cases. So what I get from this is I am more comfortable with those really large hind um, apical sesamoid fractures that sometimes you're like, oh, it's kind of big, you know, are we okay with that? Um, but I'm also very critical of front medial ones if they are very small. So, and, and when I'm talking to clients or speaking with um, potential buyers, we're giving them the information. It's not a, a yes, no um, type of conversation. It's like this is what information and data that we have out there, and then that allow them to really place a value on the animal and decide how much risk they want to take. So um, the next study was done by Hannah Wellman. She presented this in AAP in 2009. She was an intern of mine, but then, but had started this with Dr. Bramlage before she came into the ambulatory group. But here is normal on the left, and here is one of these base sesamoids on the right. This particular one's non-articular. And she looked at the racing performance of yearlings that have this fragment and she had 37 cases and looked at a lot of horses to find 37 cases. So she looked at them from 95 to 2005, so 11 years. She had about 7,000 reports um, that she was looking at and that yielded 37 cases. So this isn't the most popular or most common um, lesion. However, it's one of those ones that's really hard to, to, what to tell people because you do see them on good racehorses. Um, but you know, what, what can we tell people about these? Because we don't typically remove them if they're in the ligamentous attachment um, because then we're disrupting the ligament, which is probably just as concerning, or if not more. So she developed a grid pattern and to assign a ligamentous um, involvement on the base of these sesamoids. Um, there's the base sesamoid fragment there. And what she did is she subdivided on these two views, so on the DP and the lateral view, the base of the sesamoid into three um, equal areas, 
and also did that DP and lateral, so she has nine um, portions of this grid. And what she found in the study that actually these had equal number of starts, so 78% of them right, raced um, compared to 77% of their maternal siblings. They had decreased earnings per start, um, 1859 to 4120 on their control group, and the largest decrease in earning was on the oblique distal sesamoidian ligament, which is that the larger fragment that we saw at the beginning and, and more of the, the meat of the, um, of the base of the sesamoid. She, she didn't look at size on this. I think if you're looking at them, um, the, the, the amount of your um, brand, or base sesamoid ligaments that are involved um, is, is significant and probably, actually an ultrasound is probably our best indicator. But again, I, I typically look at size and, you know, if they're less than five millimeters, I'm less critical than I am if we have a very large fragment in that area. And basically these horses could race, they were just at a lower class of racing. Oh, I blew through that. So. That is the first portion, that's all in fetlocks. The rest of the joints are, will be after lunch.